gears a little bit. We're talking uh, not about internet commerce now, but uh, geopolitical context. We are going to turn our gaze to the Middle East and looking at why that region presents a compelling uh, case for Bitcoin adoption. You know, we have collapsing banking systems in countries like Lebanon. We have way, we have people looking for ways to store value, and that's where, in some cases, Bitcoin comes in. To talk about it, we're bringing on CoinShares co-founder and veteran crypto investor, Melton Demures from Turkey, and Simplex CEO, Nimrod Lihavi. Thanks so much for joining us, you guys. Thanks for having us, and happy having. Woo! Happy having. Yeah. yeah. Great, great message locked on the block. I'm like, so, I'm yeah, the they, dork that still gets excited about havings. It feels like a <laughs> big seller. Like we like made a it. New year. It's like a new <laughs> year. It was a good one. Yeah. No, the, the New York Times headline that like Lop tweeted yeah. out, like clearly won the internet about the havings. That would be cool to see. Yeah. Uh, Lee, kick it off. Uh, Nimrod, I wanted to start with you and ask about why does the Israel is such a hotbed for crypto development and different kinds of crypto companies when most of the audiences you guys serve are beyond Israel's borders. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, you know, I was <laughs> I was actually asked something uh, uh, very similar in one of the early conferences in Amsterdam. I think it was 2012. It was like uh, 150 people and of them, 15 were Israelis. And someone asked me, how come there's so many Israelis here? And I told them, listen, it's, it's controversial and it's technological. Of course, we're going to be here. Uh, we are always interested in, in this stuff. And I think that Simplex um, is something that's even more representful for the um, amazing abilities in Israel. We're, we're doing uh, uh, online payments with uh, zero chargeback guarantee. We're currently doing it uh, almost only with credit cards, but in uh, probably next week, actually, we're soft launching full support for banking infrastructure for companies and individuals as well. So in, in a few weeks, it won't be an acceptable excuse that it's hard to buy or hard to sell your crypto. And we're going to provide it as support to all of our integrations. We have something like 150 integrations. So it's going to roll out everywhere. Um, and I think that, you know, basically that's going to push adoption. The, the thing that Israelis are really good at is hacking stuff. You know, we're able to hack regulation. We're able to hack through the difficulties. And again, you know, it's, it's always in front of our eyes, the, the target of, of pushing it to everyone's hands. I think that, as Alex mentioned earlier, um, if we put crypto in enough people's hands, at the end, it's going to get to the impact where, you know, where we're going, we don't need roads. We won't need on-ramps and off-ramps because you'll be able to just use it. That's it. Pretty cool. Not there might be it. Yeah, there might be, you know, a, a kernel of this in the, uh, you know, in the, the hacking ethos of um, uh, the Israeli tech scene. But I'm going to turn Start to Melton. Nation. Um, you know, it's something that I kind of learn about uh, often through Lee's reporting that the relative numbers in the Middle East, like the raw numbers, they're relatively small. But the Middle East tends to be really influential in terms of crypto usage. And I just wanted your thoughts on how, how and why the Middle East has come to uh, wield such influence in the crypto space. Yeah, so um, this is a really interesting question. If we start with Turkey, I think Turkey has been making headlines in the crypto space recently. Um, ING does this uh, report on the future of banking. And in their report in 2018, they started actually including cryptocurrency in their survey that they did primarily on the retail banking side, on the consumer side of the, the banking ecosystem. And in that 2018 survey, what they found, which was really interesting, well, it's in terms of um, penetration, meaning percent of people utilizing cryptocurrency, Turkey had the highest rate of usage uh, per capita. But um, comparatively speaking to the rest of the crypto ecosystem, the Turkish market's still very small because Turkey is not an economy where people save. Um, there's a high degree of consumer indebtedness, as we see in many emerging economies, where access to credit is now easier than ever. Um, but what has been really interesting to note is Turkey is one of these really interesting countries. My family is from Turkey. I speak Turkish fluently. I spent a lot of my childhood in Turkey and in Europe before moving to the States. And I go to Turkey once or twice a year. When I talk to people there in the crypto ecosystem, what's really interesting is the 
lira um, obviously has been under a lot of pressure recently. The Turkish economy is, is large. Turkey is home to 70 million people. So it has a big population. It's a young population. It's a fairly educated population, but there isn't a lot of economic opportunity. There's a high rate of unemployment. And there's also obviously a lot of currency pressure on the lira. So it's been interesting to observe is in Turkey, 54% of consumer banking deposits are held in dollars not in lira. So interestingly, as one of the responses to sort of the, the current economic crisis, um, one of the areas the government is targeting is consumer deposits, right? Um, it's very much in contrast to other economies, for example, in Argentina, where people may not even have access to dollars and they're having to buy dollars in a, a different market. Um, so what I think you see is in, in Turkey, you know, people are more open maybe to these new ideas because they're already accustomed to trading Forex. Uh, what's really interesting is like we as Americans, when I look at my bank account, everything's in dollars and I never think of like, oh, I want to buy some euros. I want to buy some pounds. In the Middle East, like people are trading Forex in their bank account. People are actively thinking about, okay, I want to hold some of my money in lira. I want to hold some of my money in dollars. Maybe I want to hold some of my money in a different currency. Um, as Americans, that's something that doesn't enter into someone's calculus. As Europeans, now with the Eurozone um, is something that doesn't really play into their calculus. But when I was a kid, you know, we had Gilders in Holland where I lived. And then every time you drive, you know, 100 miles, you'd switch currencies. And you were thinking a lot more about changing into and out of currencies in the Middle East. You know, we're talking about a region. There are a lot of different countries. They all have their own currencies. Um, but the borders kind of socially and culturally speaking are still really fluid. Um, so to me, it's just been really interesting to see um, how up in the Middle East has been to adopting crypto cryptocurrency. The other thing I'll add, which I think Nimrod alluded to, obviously Israel has been an area where we've seen a lot of innovation, um, particularly I think there's a high degree of correlation with the IDF, um, the Israeli Defense Force in crypto innovation. And I think Israel is a country that recognizes the importance of cybersecurity. I think cybersecurity is kind of the new frontier for warfare. Um, digital security is becoming as important as, if not more important than cybersecurity, pardon physical security. Um, we see this with AWS being the largest military contract contractor in the United States now. I think the other thing that's important to touch on is um, the education system. So there are a lot of really brilliant Turkish cryptographers, mathematicians who have been a part of the crypto ecosystem. Um, and so I think just looking at the amount of innovation and the amount of technical capability and capacity coming out of these places is, is really phenomenal. And obviously, you know, we call them Arabic numerals for a reason. The Middle East has historically had a really strong um, association with innovation in the fields of mathematics and physics and, and other branches of the hard sciences. So, uh, you know, very proud of that heritage and really happy to see the region playing a role in the in the growth of not just adoption, but also development of, of new techniques, new cryptographic primitives and new computer science breakthroughs. Nimrod, proud Middle wanna, Eastern. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I want to touch on something that Milton just brought up because I think it's really important that sure. Israel is very well known for all different kinds of technology and especially it's focused on cybersecurity. But in the crypto space, we have this dichotomy between the cypherpunk values and uh, compliance requirements, but also uh, perhaps the surveillance systems that governments or other bodies might want to build into our on-ramps and off-ramps. So Nimrod, for you, how is it that you balance protecting your users' data with the compliance requirements that you have um, in terms mm -hmm. of collecting and, and distributing that data to other parties? I think that I, I think it's a phenomenal question. I think that there's always a balance um, when you're trying to push something new down the throat of the the old banks. It has to be. I mean, I, I remember again an old panel. I'll, I'll reminisce again uh, a panel a few years ago at Citibank, and everybody was saying how the banks around the world are so excited when it comes to. Uh, crypto and talking very favorably uh, about blockchain. I told them, yeah, guys, you're speaking with the innovation teams. I'm speaking with the compliance officers and they hang up the phone. So uh, it was a lot of years of a lot of frustration until understanding that you have to play along with the regulator. Uh, the way to hack it actually in a very Israeli manner is that what matters is, um, well, the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. So you can always find some hacks where you're able to provide services which are needed. And I think that what we're doing is super important. I think that at the end, the, the spirit of the law of many of the regulations is actually to protect us from bad guys. And we, because of the position that we take, because we're fighting fraudsters day in, day out, 
we see all the, the, the ugly sides of crypto, or at least the, the attempt to create ugly sides of crypto. And even though, I mean, we push something like one to two million dollars a day of uh, uh, crypto into new users' hands, which I take great pride on. But we also stop fraudsters from stealing money in huge amounts on a daily basis. So there's a lot of fraud going on uh, around uh, crypto, and it's still very hard for many governments and regulators and banks to, to catch it. We, we sometimes do catch uh, fraud cases in banks as well. Uh, just to balance it. And as Finstan said a few years ago, the $100 bill is still the best mechanism for money laundering, not crypto. Uh, but I think that, you know, it, it, with all me being a rebel and all, you have to abide by some rules in, over, in order to kind of slide it into the system easily. And then, then it can flourish. Uh, I don't know if I answered the question, but <laughs> was it good enough? I think enough? you did. That was pretty good. Okay. I mean, yeah, oh. in, very interesting thread nonetheless. Um, you did mention, you know, the one to two million dollars. I wanted to ask you, like, since the you know the lockdown has happened in, in mid March, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, you know we saw the market fluctuation just go crazy. Uh, has that like increased the amount of crypto usage or acquisition that you're seeing on the front lines of this, like? Give me yeah, some of the recent context when you're talking about these numbers. Well, it's really so we're, we're naturally we're talking about it a lot internally to, to try and understand the reasoning. And naturally, I can't, you know, whenever someone asks me, why did the price go up? I always say because more people are buying than selling. You know, there, there's no there's no smarter answer for that. But I, I think to a certain extent, without, you know, stepping on anyone's toes, I, I think, you know, basically it's just rebalancing with the devaluing of the dollar. So, you know, maybe Bitcoin didn't go up at all, just the dollar went down. And, and you know, and I'm being perfectly serious, not, you know, uh, because it's uh, uh, denominated next to the dollar and there's just so much USD in the world now, maybe it's just rebalanced uh, accordingly. Uh, I do think people in general are thinking about it. We, we ran a survey uh, to our users uh, a while back and I think something like over 70% consider themselves investors, even though the average transaction that we see is something like 500 bucks. So people are definitely investing. They're definitely interested. They're definitely getting educated. They care. They learn. They evolve. It's still, you know, we're still in a very young market after all. I mean, it's still even after a decade in, it's, it's a very young market. There's still millions of people that need to understand more. And I think the fact that we're doing it in a very global manner we're supported, supporting globally. By the way, in, in the Middle East angle, there's a huge issue with FATF restricted countries. For example, Lebanon, which you mentioned, there's no way in hell that we can onboard a, a Lebanese uh, citizen just because of regulation. So there need to be some innovation from within in order to overcome some of the, of the inherent problems in regulation. You know, as an Israeli, I have... Uh, I have a full stomach about Lebanon, but there's a huge young population which all they want to do is live their life happily and fruitfully, and they they definitely need access to crypto. Um, but you know, it's 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 still a delicate issue with many countries. I yeah. I want to talk about this, please. Okay, so I I think the fundamental um, innovation here, and, and Nimrod, since you brought it up, I'm going to run with it because I think it's really important here. Um, Bitcoin Bitcoin's really subversive uh, sort of promise is the separation of money and state, right? Um, and that has never existed before. If we think about the Middle East as a region, um, one of the big challenges plag plaguing the region, which, which I can sort of speak candidly about, is the relationship between religion and state, right? And this has sort of been... Yep. Uh, you know, one of, one of the, frankly speaking, one of the fundamental challenges and the tribalism and, you know, some of this religious strife around um, beliefs and it's been intertwined with statehood, it's been intertwined with money. And so the point you're expressing, Nimrod, I think, is you have a group of people who are just trying to live their lives. They happen to be born in a state that is the subject of sanctions as a result of the regime they're under, but they did not elect that regime in many yep. instances. In many instances, Absolutely. that regime didn't even develop organically. It was installed um, by foreign governments as a Absolutely. 
uh, you know, as a as a part of keeping the petrodollar system that has fueled the last 30 years of economic growth in, intact. And so you have people who are the subject of, of circumstance. And my parents are a great example of this. They come from a Turkish farming community. Um, they came from nothing. You know, they didn't see light bulb until, until they were 16 and 18, respectively. Like <laughs> people talk about growing up underprivileged, like talk about growing up with absolutely nothing. I mean, so I think what's really Really subversive and really interesting here is we're talking about the separation of money and state. And Hilton, the ability- I'm sorry, I have to cut you off there, but I actually would really love to continue that conversation online, it, just using maybe the hashtag consensus distributed, because I think you're touching on a really important point there. But right now, we have to cut to a commercial break. And when we come back, we'll be talking to Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss of Gemini and all other kinds of guests, actually. So uh, stay tuned. Thank you. Yep, see you after that. Ooh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin. 